Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me along for this morning's discussion, which I'm really looking forward to and I think is a, is a very important one. I, uh, in my former role at AMP, we used to have this innovation festival every two years where we'd bring out uh, leading thinkers on a range of different issues from other parts of the world, including Australia, and discuss how we might become uh, a more innovative company. And we had a dinner uh, one evening where we invited a lot of senior business executives along from uh, around the country, uh, not just in financial services but in other areas. And one of the issues we actually discussed during that evening was how uh, big business at the time uh, needed to get much closer to the university sector in Australia and um, bemoaned the fact that in the US this seems to be done so well and in many ways seems to be a real strength of their economy and we need to change things in our country to get it right here. Uh, so I think the prize in uh, the discussion this morning is a very big one. I think if we can substantially improve our ranking, as Renee said, I think it's 29 out of 30, so we can't go much lower. There's plenty of opportunity for improvement. There's a big prize for business, there's a big prize for universities and their students, and there's an even bigger prize for our country. So I think it's a really important discussion. I think particularly now, if you look at our economy, and I think most uh, business executives would be looking at the Australian economy and saying, and it's fairly obvious, we've got a pretty significant challenge as we move away from you know, a, a fabulous commodities boom and how we regenerate and reinvest in other parts of the economy. And obviously a key fact to that, and I'm telling the converted in this room, in terms of driving productivity is this uh, need to become more innovative and to foster an entrepreneurial um, position in the country that perhaps we don't have and get much better at commercialising some of the really great talent that we have in universities and amongst our entrepreneurs. And I think that's particularly critical now, given where we sit as an economy. And I sometimes get a bit frustrated. I, I feel like the debate we have publicly from time to time on the productivity, it feels like it's 20 years old, and there's not enough focus on innovation, and there's not enough, enough focus on entrepreneurship. So uh, to the extent that forums like this can help shift that debate, I, I think it's a really positive thing to do. I also think it's critical because of the digital revolution that's happening right now. And uh, I'll talk more about that and how Stone and Chalk's trying to uh, help build an ecosystem so that our country can take advantage of that. But I don't think, uh, I think you speak to some people and they look at what's happening in the tech sector at the moment and they think, well, this is the sort of the early 2000s uh, all over again. We'll have a bit of a boom, a bit of a bubble, and then we'll go back to being normal. And I suspect there, is, there are some inflated valuations in the sector at the moment. But I think, I think this time it's very different. And I think the digital, re digital revolution uh, is a major, major shift in the world's economy. Um, some of you may have read that uh, book, uh, if I forget the name right now, I'll come back to it, um, that talks about the digital revolution being as significant as the industrial revolution. I'm sure there's others in the room that are better at economic history than I am. But obviously the industrial revolution, if you look back over human, modern human history, it was about the most significant economic event in the last 2,000 years. Um, and from that event, we saw a massive growth in the world's population and we saw a massive growth in the world's GDP. The other striking thing about the Industrial Revolution is if you're on the wave as a country and as a business, you did extraordinarily well. So if you think about how the UK shifted its share of the world's economic growth as it led that Industrial Revolution, if you weren't on that wave, like China and India, uh, the next 200 years wasn't that great. So if the digital revolution is as significant as industrial revolution, even if it's half as significant, then if you're a country or a business that doesn't get involved, then you risk the same issues that some of those countries faced in the industrial revolution when they didn't get involved. So this is a really, really critical time for our country to make sure that we lead in this space. And we can't do that if the relationship between universities and business stays the same. It's just not, it's not good enough and we're not going to be able to be on that wave if we don't get that right. So just turning to what that might mean in financial services, if you think about what a financial services institution does or a bank does, at its very basic level, I mean, it assumes certain risks on behalf of other economic participants in the economy, but largely it's, it gathers data, it manipulates data, it manages that data in a way that uh, assume certain balance sheet risks and the like, and it then uses that data to improve the outcomes of its consumers or clients. So it's very much data-driven. 
And in fact, I think there was one uh, leading banking CEO in the United States who said, uh, you know, a bank was just an IT company with a banking license. So I think what the digital revolution is doing, not only in financial services, but certainly in financial services, and it's why fintech is, is growing exponentially. Uh, Ian Polari, who's in the room this morning, who's a, a leading uh, person in terms of forming Stone and Chalk, sent an email last night. We're looking at fintech investment around the world. And I think in the first six months of this year, um, it represents 25% of the investment in the last five years. So it's really going very strong. And I think people can see the opportunity and the challenges in this space for existing incumbents if you don't get it right. And I think what the digital revolution is doing for many financial institutions and indeed other companies is it's making people stop and think and saying, well, actually, what business are we in? I mean, if you think about a bank as being an IT company with a banking licence or basically at its core, a data management company, it sort of gets you thinking very differently about the capability sets you need to be successful in that space. And also gets you thinking very differently about the competitors you might be facing in the future. And they might be very different to the competitors you faced in the past. So suddenly, big uh, companies like Google, Facebook and the like, Apple are potential competitors. Um, and perhaps that's a bit of a surprise than perhaps more traditional competitors. And again, I think a whole lot of industries are starting to think about, well, what business am I really in? And is the capability set that has made me successful today and has built my business model today, is that the same capability set that I will need going forward to be successful? And I think a lot of companies, a lot of financial institutions are realising very quickly that in the digital world, certainly there are skills that they've got over many years that they can take forward, but there's actually very new skills that they need to absorb and be very good at. And some of those, they're not necessarily that well placed on. So for example, I'll come back to this in a moment, but um, cyber security I think is a, is a increasing skill gap and concern right around the world in financial services. And that is also very true uh, in Australia. And again, that's pretty critical if you think about your model in financial services. It's also quite important that we get this right as a country. So, Currently, uh, financial services in Australia represents 9% of our GDP. It employs more than 420,000 Australians and it pays direct taxes of more than $11 billion. And many of those 400,000 jobs are actually very well paid jobs, highly skilled jobs. So it's sort of a sector we'd like to promote and continue to do very well in. And if you think about the challenges and opportunities in that sector from digitalisation. And whilst not everything can cross borders, and to some extent because of the regulation peculiar to Australia's financial services sector and the tax laws being different to other countries, it's not necessarily as easy for technology to leap across borders. But if you look at many of the other industries, it's actually the digital threat is coming from offshore and the jobs are being created offshore. So you don't have to have the same physical presence that you had to have in Australia once to be necessarily a significant competitor. And so what we need to make sure as a country and as a sector is that we evolve fintech here, we evolve those technology skills and capabilities here, so the jobs are created here. And that in fact we can use that technology to advance and expand internationally and export services rather than to do the other way. I mean, Australia, as you all know, is one of the greatest users of technology and one of the fastest adapters of the use of technology. We sort of have to turn that on its head a bit and make sure we're also one of the fastest developers of technology going forward. So I think uh, really what I'm saying is from a sector perspective, this is really important to get right and it's also really important for our country. And in fact, if you look at the UK, the UK government has really led very aggressively in this space. So if you look at the UK economy, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I suspect their financial services sector is an even greater part of their GDP. And so sort of they took a big hit uh, in that space uh, with the, the global recession or GD, um, financial crisis, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they've done some very significant steps on a public policy stage and shown real leadership from the government to base, basically say, in fintech, we have to lead in this space around the world if we want to continue to lead in financial services. So they've made that leap. And some of the changes in the technology are significant. I was just speaking to Glenn before uh, the session started. I know he had to leave. 
but many of you will have heard of Bitcoin um, because the really significant thing about Bitcoin is not the actual cryptocurrency, it's the technology that it's used called blockchain. And again, I know some in the room will be familiar with that, but it's about distributed ledgers. And so what, what blockchain technology does is it essentially or potentially can replace the trusted agent in the banking or payment system. So it uses a whole series of computers around the world to confirm the authenticity of a transaction. You don't actually need a bank or a, uh, a settlement exchange to actually confirm the transaction. So blockchain has the power to revolutionise financial services. And there's a big debate going on in the industry at the moment, will be it just a new form of technology that incumbents will use to lower their costs and improve outcomes for consumers and clients, or will that technology actually really challenge the existing sector? And instead of, as I said, having to rely on a trusted agent, an institution, you now rely on a distributed ledger to recognise um, the settlement of transactions. So it really is significant in that space and if you look around the VC world and where it's investing in fintech, there's a very significant investment going into this area. That leads into a whole lot of other challenges if you're in a financial institution today like, like cyber security, there's obviously increased regulation, the typical balance sheet risks and all those sorts of things but I think one of the biggest challenges then financial institutions are starting to think about is, well, how do I innovate? How do I make sure that as an organisation, if I'm leading a large financial institution, a bank, insurer, funds manager, whatever, how do I make sure that I'm taking advantage of the fintech opportunities? And how do I make sure I'm ahead of that curve rather than my business model be disrupted? And so a big challenge for a lot of financial institutions at the moment is how do they innovate? And they're taking a range of different approaches to that. Uh, some of them are working very hard on the things they do internally, and you will read in the paper about you know, CBA's lab and uh, Westpac Garage and all these new physical spaces they're creating to develop uh, innovation and the work they're trying to do on their cultures. Where many banks are looking in terms of how they develop their cultures and innovate, they're looking at the cultures of Google and Amazon and Apple and saying, well, if they're going to be potentially our competitors in future, how do we develop the same sort of talent and how do we develop similar cultures? So this need to innovate um, and how you do that uh, is, is a really strong challenge for many of the financial institutions today. What, what all that means is there is no better time than now to substantially improve the relationship between universities and business. I think it's a real watershed time that we can take advantage on either whether you're a business or whether you're an academic institution. Firstly, I think the, the governments around the country are starting to realise that the productivity challenge that we face is not going to be addressed by just looking at things that, as I said, we used to do 20 years ago. We need a more innovative and entrepreneurial culture. And we can't look to the government to do everything, but I think there's, perhaps it's taking a bit longer than we'd all like, but there's a dawning realisation um, picking up on that, uh, I think that famous quote from Joseph Schumpeter, the famous econom economist, that, you know, the, the, the outstanding fact in the history of um, capitalism is innovation. And I think the government's starting to get that message. Secondly, if you think about the concept of design thinking and the recognition that businesses can't innovate internally, they need to partner with others externally, I think most incumbent financial institutions in Australia are looking at what they're doing and saying, sure, we need to try and change our culture, sure, we need to try and innovate more within, but they recognise that you just can't innovate at the same speed or with the same creativity that you can with a startup. As a part of Stone and Chalk, I went with the CEO, Alex Scandura, and we spoke to a smaller uh, financial institution in Australia. And they were talking about how they, ha they felt they had a competitive advantage because they, could, they were more agile and could move more quickly than a very large institution. And then a fintech that had two or three people in their business spoke to them. And they realised that maybe they were smaller than a big bank, but they weren't as agile or as um, capacity to move and innovate compared to a small startup was light years away. And, and what many of the startups do is they're actually closer to the friction points 
or the problems that consumers have, and they're able to do to address those and move in a much quicker way. Their challenge is they don't have capital, or it's hard to get capital, and they don't have an existing customer base. And so there's this real symmetry or complementary opportunity between existing institutions that have lots of that stuff and startups that don't. So again, it's a really interesting time that big financial institutions, when they look at design thinking, are saying, we can't innovate within. We need to work with people outside to do that. And of course, a key opportunity and a key partner that they can work with are the people sitting in this room. So there's a mindset shift in business that their boundaries need to be more fungible, they need to be more open, they need to be more fluid, and they need to partner with people outside their organisation. They get that we lack critical skills in Australia, cyber security is an, is an example, and they can't deal with that on their own. They need to partner with people again in this room. Also, many institutions are starting to realise that actually they've, one of their greatest skills, or sorry, capabilities or assets, is the younger people sitting in their organisation, who are much closer and have a much greater understanding of technology and how it's used by millennials than many of the people perhaps in this room, including me. I do some consulting with a professional services firm. They're doing work on blockchain. What they decided to do was bring in two of their graduates into the room with two senior partners to help develop their positioning in this space. Now, it's just been inspiring and, and frankly overwhelming to see the value that these two graduates add. I mean, one of them's a blockchain junkie, right? He comes from UTS, he gets it, he's out there doing it. And so the, the value that he's added to the, that senior group of partners is phenomenal. And that's another example of people in business starting to understand the value that can be added. And again, I think there's also an increasing recognition in business that you need a complete ecosystem for this thing to work. And that's what Stone and Chalk's trying to do. And this comes from a lot of the research, in fact, Ian did uh, with the Committee for Sydney and the New South Wales Government, was looking at fintech around the world and saying, what do you need to get it to work? And a lot of these new industries, you need economic clusters. You need complete ecosystems for them to operate, for them to be effective. What Stone and Chalk is not just a co-working space, it's trying to work really hard with all the participants in the economic system, the ecosystem, to build that cluster to facilitate the success of fintech startups in Australia. And you can't have a complete ecosystem in this space if you don't involve universities, you don't involve their students, and you don't involve academia in building that ecosystem. So again, those four or five key reasons, this is a really good time to be having this discussion and a really good time to make a difference. What can we do very quickly, because I'm probably running over time already. Um, I think the first thing we have to do is we can't keep looking to government to say, you need to fix this. Now, I don't pretend to understand the incentives that work in universities. I've never worked in a university. I don't know whether they create barriers for universities to participate more effectively with business. But this is a two-way partnership. Business in Australia haven't, up until now, looked closely enough at the value that they can get from partnering with academic institutions. And again, that's starting to change for all the reasons I said. I know Westpac, I'm a director of Westpac, and I'm speaking to the CEO uh, at a function the other night. They would love to get more involved in funding research in universities. If you look at the uh, internships that I think Renee was talking about earlier, I mean, most businesses are now saying, how do we get more university students while they're doing their degrees into their businesses? So again, this professional services firm I'm working at, they don't actually want to bring in typical interns that actually are what they do. They want to bring in technologists and engineers because they know that's the future. So a lot of this, I think, about the success to improving this going forward is improving the formal informing networks and the way we touch each other to improve the outcome so business can better understand the value you can add and you can better understand the value business can add to, to what you do. So I think those internships are really important, but you have to have a formal system for that to work. It doesn't work if you say to business, well, this professor's quite keen on it. Can you give her a call or give him a call and see if you can work something out? Now, I don't know, you might have much more improved formal, you need a formal mechanism that business can partner with you on to land in internships and get it to work. You have to have the resources behind that. That's what business expect. They don't have the time to ring five or six people 
and sit down and try and work out who the best in the university is to work to get the internships to happen. You have to have a coordinated program to make that happen. You've got great international networks in your academic uh, relationships that benefit business. Um, course design. Now again, I'm going to tell you what I think about this and the academics in the room might say, I don't know what I'm talking about, but um, that won't be the first time I've got that feedback. Business looks at universities today and basically says you take far too long to design new courses in Australia. And we keep sending our people overseas. So we keep sending our people to Stanford and other universities because Stanford's got a course on Bitcoin and blockchain. We don't have that in Australia. So um, we often, you come to UTS and you can do a course in design thinking. I forget the professor's name who's leading that. And it's a fantastic course from what I can tell, right? What's design thinking say? You have to focus on the problems that need solving and you have minimal viable propositions and you move quickly to solve problems. So when I raise this with universities, they tell me all the reasons why it takes five years to three years to get a new course up. That's not acceptable going forward. We have to work out with business how we can promote much improvement in the, and I'm not, I'm sort of feel like I'm just criticising universities. Businesses don't get what they can benefit from universities either and they've got issues to deal with. But these are some of the things that we can solve together so that we can be more effective. I also think partnering with industry hubs like Stone and Chalk is important. So Alex, the CEO at Stone and Chalk, again, would, the fintechs would love to have young interns working in the fintech startups. Um, I don't know how we improve mobility across the sector so we understand, business understands better how universities work and then universities understand how business works. And also on the research side, the, the challenge or the issue that business often has is they want research done that solves their problems. And often they look at the research that's getting done and they say, and I know you need pure academic research and there's real value in that, but um, a lot of the research that gets done, business looks at it and says, well, that's nice, but um, that's not going to help me solve any problems. That's not going to help me advance my case. So somehow we need to align the investment in research that's a bit more closer to what business needs. Again, this is not just an issue with uh, the universities. Business hasn't spent enough time understanding the value that you can bring and how we can partner more effectively together. And I, as I said, I think business is starting to get what you can do and the value that you can bring uh, if you're sitting in the university sector. But I think if you, if you step back and think, if I'm sitting in a university, as I said, this is a great time because business, I think, is starting to get what you can deliver, and it's such a wonderful opportunity for you to improve your institution. I mean, if we can partner more effectively together, you're going to get a better, design, better course design, you're going to have students that are more employable, that's going to improve your ranking as a university because students are going to want to come here because they know if they work on this stuff with internships they can get jobs. I actually think, maybe you don't agree, you'll actually have better academics because they're working more closely with business and have got a better understanding of what business is doing. We're going to have improved economic outcomes for universities because instead of students going offshore, they're going to study here and potentially we can improve the export of the education. So there's a whole, I think, raft of benefits for, for academic institutions, a whole raft of benefits for businesses. Businesses are starting to get that this is really important. It's a great opportunity and time to pounce. We just now need to start working through forums like this uh, to make it happen. I might stop there and then um, open it up for questions. Thank you.